towns and cities. So a coolish start to another showery day on Tuesday. Again, the showers will develop across pretty much all areas. Again, some of them could be quite heavy. And again, they'll be fairly slow moving. I suspect, though, parts of southwest Wales, southwest England, not seeing too many showers. Certainly by the afternoon, looking largely dry here with some sunny spells. At the same time, a lot of cloud. Uh, for Northern Ireland and plenty of heavy showers across eastern England. Again on the cool side, but with a bit more sunshine in the southwest, 17, 18, possibly 19 Celsius. Still, the showers keep going as we head through Tuesday evening and into Wednesday, and we'll keep a fair few showers during Wednesday. And that's how it's looking as we lead into the big weekend, of course, the Jubilee weekend. So likely to still be a few showers around at first, but overall the weather trend's becoming drier and warmer for the Jubilee. Goodbye. We are GB News. We're right across this great nation. On TV, on radio, on digital. Absolutely everywhere. We don't talk down to you. We embrace all voices. With honest and civilised conversation. We're not part of the establishment. We're one of you. And we're only getting started. Join us on GB News, the People's Channel. Britain's news channel. Every morning from six o'clock, we'll wake you up with GB News Breakfast with all the stories you didn't know from the night before. So whether it's serious news, entertainment, or your own views from all over our great nation, we're here to kick off your day with a smile. And the national media should be reflecting and reporting what's happening here. You will notice the Northwestern accents. <laughs> Whether you're with us on TV, radio or online, every morning, it's breakfast from 6am. Hope you can join us. Join us for Ministry of Offence, the comedy panel show that's just like the news, in that the left fights the right and it doesn't really seem to matter who wins. We cover the big stories. It was in fact a troop of baboons and not angry vegans. I like that. And the really important stories. Fact! Naked cow gets stuck in swimming pool. It's a headline in a lot of local newspapers. Yeah. <laughs> We're on the same team, Nick. Yeah, but I'm just helping you. Join us for Ministry of Offence, Saturday nights, 8 o'clock on GB News. I'm Dan Wooten. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV, where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews, and A-list guests. And I guarantee you, no spin, no bias, no censorship, and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wooten tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. And welcome to another week of On The Money here on GB News, where we're focused on the UK's cost of living crisis, helping you to beat the squeeze. I'm Liam Halligan, and for the next hour, we'll be talking about the spiralling oil price and the prospect of power cuts as war in Ukraine and the rift between East and West rumbles on, threatening energy supplies from Russia. Plus, we report on renewed travel chaos as countless flights are cancelled just as the summer holiday season is starting up. And we've got a fabulous Money Talks interview with Andrea McLean. Yes, that's right, the Loose Women TV presenter star who chucked in a glamorous job to launch her own business. On the money, after the GB News headlines with Rosie Wright. Good afternoon. It's just one minute past one. I'm Rosie Wright, keeping you up to date on GB News. The French Interior Minister says massive and industrial scale fraud regarding tickets is what's to blame for the chaotic scenes at the Champions League final on Saturday. Violence outside the stadium in Paris led to English fans, Liverpool fans, being tear gassed by French police. French authorities say that out of the 29 or 30 people arrested, more than half are British citizens. Well, Boris Johnson has urged UEFA to launch a formal investigation into what went wrong. Minister for Tech and Digital Economy Chris Philp told GB News a quick investigation is vital. I'm deeply concerned. Uh, I've seen those uh, video pictures showing uh, Liverpool fans, children, disabled fans as well, getting pepper sprayed by the French police for no apparent reason. Uh, I am deeply, deeply concerned about that. The policing by the French police does look 
heavy-handed, and that's why it's important to get this UEFA inquiry underway as quickly as possible to urgently find out what really happened. Coal-fired power plants, which were due to close later this year, may need to stay open to provide backup electricity this winter. A government spokesperson says the decision is due to Moscow's invasion of Ukraine and major disruptions to the flow of Russian gas. The Times newspaper reports as many as six million households could face power cuts if President Putin reduces supplies to the EU. Well, Andy Mayer, CEO and energy analyst at the Institute of Economic Affairs, told GB News he's confident measures can be taken to avoid blackouts. It's highly unlikely that we will experience blackouts in the near term. What tends to happen is there is a cascade of different things that uh, the national grid can do in order, for example, to shut down heavy industry. Not a good thing, but something that means that you can prioritise hospitals and homes in terms of heating and lighting. So there isn't yet a fundamental and substantial risk of this happening, but there could be if the government keeps going down this path of trying to make oil and gas as expensive as possible and discouraging domestic investment. The price of the cheapest pasta in UK supermarkets has risen by 50% in the year since April 2021. The analysis from the Office for National Statistics also says the price of bread and minced beef went up by 16%. It's as inflation hit a 40-year high. Downing Street says it's going to ditch 350 European Union rules. Number 10 says their new procurement bill will rip up hundreds of complicated and bureaucratic regulations and replace them instead with a single framework for securing public sector contracts. The bill, which should make it easier to exclude suppliers, for example, who underperform and bring in new competition processes for emergency buying, is expected to become law next year. Chancellor of the Duchy of Lancaster, Steve Barclay, says the reforms will help to improve public services. Northern Ireland's Parliament is meeting today to make a new attempt to nominate a Speaker, a First Minister and a Deputy. It's after more than 30 members of the Legislative Assembly signed a recall petition following a motion by Sinn Féin. The Democratic Unionist Party has called the move a stunt. The DUP is blocking the formation of an executive as part of its protest against the Northern Ireland Protocol. The Spanish Prime Minister says NATO's support for Ukraine is unbreakable and that the Russian President Vladimir Putin will not reach his objectives in Ukraine. Russian forces are advancing into Severodonetsk, the largest city that Kyiv still partly controls in the eastern Luhansk region. President Zelensky says around 90% of buildings in the area are damaged and that there are no communications in the city. Well, meanwhile, the UK's Ministry of Defence says Russia's fighting forces are experiencing poor morale and discipline problems amid credible reports of mutinies. The winners of the Eurovision Song Contest have raised over £710,000 for Ukraine's military by selling the contest's trophy. A wave of public support saw the Kalish Orchestra triumph with their entry, Stefania. The winners sold their crystal microphone in a Facebook auction. The money will be raised and to used to buy an unmanned aerial system for the armed forces. To commemorate the Queen's Platinum Jubilee, a special projection has taken place at Marble Arch to celebrate her 70-year reign. The National Portrait Gallery displayed six portraits from its collection, ranging from 1947 to 2014. You're up to date now on GB News and I'll bring you more as it happens. Now let's head to Liam for On The Money. And coming up on The Money today, oil prices are up, almost a third higher than before war in Ukraine. And they're two thirds up on this time last year. As the Prime Minister warns petrol retailers not to overdo the price rises, we're being warned we could see the return of 1970s style power cuts. Plus, families trying to get away for half-term are facing cancelled flights and airport chaos. Why, oh, why does this happen so often? We hold a detailed discussion. And each day on The Money features an in-depth Money Talks interview. Today we're talking to TV star turned entrepreneur Andrea McLean. I sat down with Andrea to talk about starting her business. This girl is on fire alongside her husband Nick Feeney and the reasons why she left Loose Women in 2020. I realised it wasn't something that I could continue doing as a bit part thing. 
Um, Nick had already given up his job to, to work full time on it. I was trying to oversee it and, and work together with him, but still splitting myself into a thousand pieces doing presenting work. And it just made sense that I needed to actually commit. So the, the, the biggest obstacle really was overcoming the fear of making that jump in the first place. Andrew McLean coming up later in the show. And as ever, I want your questions, opinions, ideas. What do you think of the issues raised in today's On The Money? Email gbfuse at gbnews.uk or tweet at gbnews. And don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel. I'll read out some of your messages later in the show, so stay with us. This is GB News. I'm Liam Halligan, and you're On The Money. Now, before Russia invaded Ukraine, crude oil cost around $90 a barrel. As war erupted, oil prices surged, of course, given that Russia is a massive energy exporter and there was much talk of immediate bans on the sale of Russian oil and gas in the West. That hasn't happened, at least not for the most part, but still, oil is once again getting very expensive. Brent crude was trading at $115 a barrel this morning. 27% up on before war in Ukraine and an astonishing 66% more expensive than this time last year. The UK's North Sea oil and gas production has halved since the turn of the century. Newly spooked by energy security concerns given the West's rift with Russia, ministers are now issuing new licences for North Sea exploration despite concerns of environmental protesters. Boris Johnson said to be furious as well that petrol stations haven't passed on the full 5p cut in fuel duty to motorists at some pumps. The Prime Minister has asked officials to draw up proposals to, quote, name and shame petrol retailers who aren't passing on those tax benefits to consumers. Having said that, if oil prices do keep rising as this Russia-Ukraine war rumbles on, then petrol and diesel prices are likely to get even higher whatever the government says and does. And there's concern that if Russia cuts off energy supplies to Western Europe, particularly gas used to generate electricity, that as many as 6 million UK households could experience power cuts. It seems Moscow could play hardball, limiting both food and fuel supplies to the West. Spiralling inflation, soaring oil prices, threatened blackouts... Each day, life in the UK seems to resemble more and more the Britain of my childhood. And that's our On The Money question today. Does the UK face the prospects of 1970s-style power cuts? Grown-up conversations with people who know their stuff. That's what we do here on The Money. And today, I'm joined by David Fife, returning to the show. He is Chief Economist at Argus Media, which specialises in commodity markets. Another expert, Malcolm Grinston, Senior Research Fellow at the Centre for Energy Policy at Imperial College London. And Helen Thomas, in the house, CEO of Blonde Money, one of our regular panellists. Great to see you, Helen. Let's start with you first, David. David, I'm trying to get my head around this. You've forgotten more about oil markets than I'll ever know, but I do try and keep an eye on them. It is probably the most important price in the world, after all. Surely, surely, the global economy is slowing. Shouldn't the oil price then be coming down? Yeah, I mean, I, th I think you're right. There are some real risks for global economic growth, particularly the inflationary pressures that you're talking about, uh, you know, a strengthening dollar, higher interest rates. Over time, that will act to slow demand. Uh, but what we're confronting at the moment is the fact that industry inventories across the petroleum complex are very, very tight. OPEC is raising supply. Uh, you know, unwinding the deal it put in place to restrain output at the time of the pandemic. Um, but essentially, we've got, a, we've got a system that's running on fumes. And although they, we think supply will increase and demand will soften towards the end of the year, it's going to take some months, I think, till the market gets a little bit more comfortable uh, that supplies are a, a little bit higher. Malcolm Grimston, on the money, viewers and listeners know well that there's uh, at least a push by ministers to encourage more exploration in the North Sea. You and I have discussed that on the show many times. But that will take a long time to come on stream, if you like, won't it? That's not going to help 
bring oil prices down under control, bringing them, uh, taming them by pumping more oil, producing more oil to put a lid on those prices anytime soon. No, that's right. So I mean, oil prices are notoriously uh, volatile and they have always uh, been. And we've seen uh, massive increases like this, the most obvious being during the 1970s. And it did take about 10 years for that uh, those significant increases to work their way through the system. Um, we're not here talking about a structural shortage of oil. It's largely political. It may become structural if in the long term the Russian reserves are written off uh, for, for use in, in Europe and elsewhere for political reasons. Um, but, I mean, I, I suspect we won't be seeing the power cuts this uh, winter. We're not in the same position as the early 70s when we were getting three quarters of our electricity from domestically mined coal and the coal mining unions went on strike and cut off that uh, that supply. We're much more diverse now, but it does once again point out the folly of not making long-term investments in reliable energy sources uh, because you happen to have enough kit to keep you going day to day. Uh, as we've done over the last 20 years, we really do need to start investing in the longer term now, as well as dealing with the short term crisis. Helen, you've worked at the top of politics. You used to work for some bloke called George Osborne, I think. And your consultancy now really is about looking at the implications for, na for financial markets of, of politics. <coughs> so do you think the politics of the environment have changed significantly now, given that ministers are spooked by energy security concerns. They're issuing a lot more licences to explore in the North Sea than ever they would have before, and yet they're still not getting rid of those energy, uh, renewable industry subsidies on people's electricity bills, are they? And there's 25% of electricity bills. So how de-greened, if you like, is this government? Yeah, it's all very conflicting, isn't it? Um, it's all very short term. We've heard there from Malcolm about a lack of long term thinking. It's been in place for a while, and I think that the you know the the green transition has been understandably unchallenged for mm. a period, hasn't mm. it? It's it, and it needed to gain ascendancy. It needed to be prioritised to, to even begin. Mm. But yes, what we're now seeing is that conflict of energy security, of um, frankly Russia weaponising, understandably weaponising. Um, that the energy that it produces. So, at some stage, the government is going to have to bite the bullet and decide which one it is prioritising. And I think the finance industry is also having to deal with this. There's been um, some real um, arguments about something called ESG. Yeah. Um, some of the viewers will probably have heard about that, in environmental, sustainable, social governance rules. Um, all very laudable, all should really be part of what you're thinking anyway. Big companies have to tick all these boxes yes. in order to be virtuous, but it costs money. Well, it does. And also, what is it to be virtuous? We've already mm -hmm. seen, you know, th things like defence stocks, which were kind of thought a bit evil, I suppose. And now they're now, seen as flavour of the month. They are. And, and, and flavour of the month, that's the thing, isn't it, Liam? That's the thing. That's the problem we've <laughs> Flavour of the week. Well, that's the problem we've got with, the, with all of this policy. You can't turn around the oil tanker to borrow an expression immediately, right? You can't just suddenly say, oh, we want to we want to be green. Oh, no, we don't. We want to have this. We want to mm. make sure we're diversified. And that's why it's a mess. So uh, hopefully, one way or other, the government will decide which one it's going for. David, let's go back to you, uh, Chief Economist at Argus Media. I mean, the reason we're talking about the prospect of 1970s-style power cuts is there sort of voices in the dark from government are placing these thoughts in the paper uh, sort of semi-anonymously warning us that there may be this issue this coming autumn. I don't quite see the logic of why they're, they're doing that. I mean, do you share Malcolm Grimston's view that we're a long way from that situation, we're a long way from the 70s? Or, or given our lack of gas storage that we now have, of course, the, the, our biggest gas storage facility, the rough... Uh, underground cavern off the coast of Yorkshire was closed. Do you think, given our lack of gas storage, uh, we are in danger of facing 1970s-style power cuts if, as Helen Thomas says, Russia chooses to really weaponise its energy exports? Well, first off, I'd say I, I'd agree with your contributors who said that, you know, supply is much more diversified now um, than it was back in the 1970s. And uh, unfortunately, I can also remember the power cuts 
of the 1970s. Uh, the second point you're looking good for it. Let me say is, that is it really in Russia's interest to uh, cut off the gas? Uh, because I, you know, I think there's there's a pretty high dependence on the part of Russia. They don't have logistical options in terms of exporting the gas elsewhere. Uh, and a lot of the revenues they've accumulated in the first half of the year, um, you know, if they're not in rubles, they may, may struggle to access some of that money. So I'm not sure that the Putin regime ultimately, when push comes to shove, will be very keen on an outright uh, cutting off of supplies the coming winter. Malcolm, let me put this to you, the same similar question to what I said to ask of Helen Thomas just then. To what extent do you think government energy policy has systemically changed as a result of this, you know, clear and ongoing scare we've had about our own energy security here in Britain? The, the great challenge for energy policy is you're trying to keep three plates in the air at the same time. You hope for supplies that are economically uh, attractive. You want supplies that are secure, particularly with electricity. And you want supplies that are environmentally acceptable. And inevitably, those three change their position. When in the early years of this uh, century, there seemed to be no problem with supply. We have massive uh, uh, production from the North Sea in the UK. Europe as a whole had uh, reasonable gas uh, production and there was plenty of gas around. Russia wasn't seen as a particular threat then. Uh, and the uh, economics were fine, the very low prices. Then at that stage, unsurprisingly, environment rose to the top of the agenda. If you move into a world where there are some challenges over security, I don't think they're acute yet, but they might become so, and certainly there are massive challenges over the economy, then they move up to the top of the agenda and inevitably environment, for a while at least, moves down that agenda because it's a crowded space. And the real problem is that if you follow one of those uh, things, say economy, it quite often has negative effects on your uh, security and environment. We could have much cheaper power prices if we were prepared not to do any investment in the long term. Uh, but in the long term, we'd run into security problems and wouldn't be addressing the environmental uh, mm. issues. So, yes, it certainly is the case that as the environment changes, so does our policy stance with respect to those three requirements. Very interesting. Well, thanks to my guest there on that chat, uh, David Fife of Argus Media. Always good to talk to you. And, of course, Malcolm Grimston of Imperial College London. Fabulous contributions. Helen Thomas is going to stay with us for the rest of the show. This is On The Money with me, Liam Halligan. After the break, we will be hearing about that travel chaos across UK airports. Thousands of half-term holidaymakers, lucky things. They face cancelled holidays, delays and lengthy queues. That's not good for anybody. Your emails are flooding in thick and fast. We'll read out some of those shortly. Stay with us. You're on the money. We are GB News. We're right across this great nation. On TV, on radio, on digital. Absolutely everywhere. We don't talk down to you. We embrace all voices with honest and civilised conversation. We're not part of the establishment. We're one of you. And we're only getting started. Join us on GB News, the people's channel. Britain's news channel. Every morning from six o'clock, we'll wake you up with GB News Breakfast with all the stories you didn't know from the night before. So whether it's serious news, entertainment, or your own views from all over our great nation, we're here to kick off your day with a smile. And the national media should be reflecting and reporting what's happening here. You will notice the Northwestern accents. <laughs> whether you're with us on TV, radio, or online, every morning, it's breakfast from 6 a.m. Hope you can join us. Join us for Ministry of Offence, the comedy panel show that's just like the news, in that the left fights the right and it doesn't really seem to matter who wins. We cover the big stories. It was in fact a troop of baboons and not angry vegans. I like that. And the really important stories. Fat naked cow gets stuck in swimming pool. It's a headline in a lot of local newspapers. <laughs> yeah. We're on the same team, Nick. Yeah, but I'm just helping you. Join us for Ministry of Offence, Saturday nights, 8 o'clock on GB News. 
I'm Dan Wooten. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wooten tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. And welcome back. It's 1.22, you're on the money here on GB News, TV, DAB, plus digital radio and online. Now, half-term starts today for many schools across the UK and some families are hoping to get away on holiday for some early summer sun. But widespread flight cancellations are wrecking getaway plans for thousands, with passengers on EasyJet being among the worst affected. EasyJet have cancelled more than 200 flights due to take off over the next 10 days. And the travel company TUI has also faced problems, blaming operational and supply chain issues for the cancellation of multiple flights. So what is going wrong? What remedies are there for people whose travel plans are in tatters? And will the chaos continue right through the summer? Well, here to, joining us talking about these important issues is Simon Calder, travel correspondent at The Independent, friend of the show. Simon, what is going on again, again, again? Well, let me take you back to, let's say, the start of 2020. The UK had by a mile the best aviation in Europe, um, aviation industry in Europe, arguably in the world. Mm. You know, the best airlines, British Airways, Virgin Atlantic, EasyJet, Jet2. Um, we also had Ryanair with its main base of operations. Pretty good airports as well. Well, yeah. Um, Heathrow, Gatwick, incredibly efficient use of um, two runways and one runway, respectively. Manchester obviously doing well. So we had the best of, of all possible times. Then the UK government brought in the most draconian, expensive, onerous, confusing travel restrictions of any country in Europe, and airports, airlines went from 100% to 5% of their operations. Partly because Heathrow in particular, but, you know, Heathrow, Gatwick, Stansted, Manchester, they're, they're global hubs, aren't oh, oh, they? Yes. They're global uh, hubs, so many, many, many people use the UK to fly somewhere else, and they well, were scared about the uh, pandemic. Well, no, it, it, it was more the just, just the kind of suffocating effects of, of travel restrictions, I would say. And this left the industry absolutely uh, on its knees. And, of course, they accrued, as you will know, billions of pounds of mm, debt. Mm. They now need to pay that off. They see this incredible demand, really pent-up demand. I mean, whatever you've been talking about, the uh, cost of living crisis, mm. people are kind of making a special exception for their mm, holidays. Mm, they mm. just want to get away. Um, and the airlines want to cash in on that. And, frankly, I think EasyJet and also British Airways have over-promised on what they can do. Scheduling British, too many flights yeah, that they if, logistically if it, can't then yeah. deliver. Um, British Airways, to be fair, they're cancelling, they're, they're thinning out their schedules, but they're doing it one week, two weeks, three weeks in advance, giving you plenty of time to make your other arrangements. Mm. Last week was catastrophic for e EasyJet. Hundreds of flights cancelled. And finally, Friday afternoon, they had a kind of crisis meeting. They said, right, we're going to cancel 240 flights between now and a week today. And that means that people at least get some certainty and we'll just hope we can run the rest of the operation. Sadly, they can't, as people watching this at home who should be in Seville or Rome today will know because um, those flights were cancelled at one hour's notice this oh morning. God. So oh, it's messy. That's just you outrageous. You mentioned TUI. I mean, well, whenever you hear the term operational difficulties, you know that things are going wrong in a, a multiplicity of ways. Poor old um, uh, Tui, uh, well, poor old Tui's passengers, really, they spent, in many cases, hours at mm. uh, Manchester, Birmingham, Gatwick Airport, only to be told late on, your flight's cancelled, mm. your holiday's off, go home, um, and uh, we're, we're, we're sorry, we'll give you a full refund. On top of that, of course, they have to pay them compensation, but absolutely ghastly. Helen, it seems, uh, I mean, we all know Simon called uh, Doyen Travel journalist, he, not somebody with an axe to grind, particularly in this case. It seems as if the government may have been a bit heavy-handed and our aviation industry, you know, second or third biggest in the world under most headings, has really been hammered. Well, it sounds like there's a number of elements to this. There is... Um, the business is getting it wrong, as we've just heard there from Simon. Different businesses, different airlines have dealt with this differently. They are 
But, and, and why are they getting it wrong? Well, because we had a massive shutdown, a massive reopening, and it is difficult to get the right people in the right spot. Mm. So I, I sort of have some sympathy with those operational difficulties mm. because um, there's so many parts of the process. But then we have the government, as you say. As we've just heard, you know, the, 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 the multiplicity of regulations, the changes, I think that was that's probably, mm. if I were a regular traveller, and maybe Simon can talk about this, I don't know how it compares to the rest of the world, but the fact it was, you need this bit, no, you need that bit, no, now you do, now you don't, three weeks' mm. time you might not yeah. need it, but... Hang on, you're on holiday. You need Bits to of paper back. flying everywhere, mobile phones really out of charge. I, my I pass is on my phone, I promise. But, uh, yeah, exactly. But, I, you know, look, at the end of the day, I think we should stand back and say, you know, this is a bit like 1945. You suddenly yeah. realise, you know, you don't just go back to where you were in 1939. Big emergency has happened. Um, and, uh, you know, a lot of parts of this chain are to blame, it seems to me. You can't get your holiday back from work, though, can you? A lot of people really inconvenienced, and the cost of getting to the airport and the stress... Can people get compensation? Well, look, the, 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 the main thing is people need their holidays, for goodness sake. Many of them for over two years haven't had a proper family holiday and therefore you need to insist on your rights. Now, mm. we do have the European Air Passenger Rights Rules absolutely explicit. If you have your flight cancelled, then they have to get you there on the same day if there is any seat available. And if that's just business class on a rival airline, they have to buy that for you. That mm. is absolutely their law, the, the rules. Now, I am hearing many, many cases of people who are told, oh, no, we can't do that. Our next flight's on Wednesday. Uh, you've got to wait around for that. You haven't. You can travel earlier. Of course, while you're waiting for that, they've got to pay for hotels and they've got to pay for uh, your meals. And on top of that, they've got to give you cash compensation, 220 20 pounds for shorter flights, 350 pounds for longer flights. But people, yeah, you know, the cash compensation is something, but it's not doesn't make up for a missed holiday. And uh, uh, my fear is that things are going to get worse before they really? get better. Well, because we've got the summer peak coming up. Um, we've got a very, very tight labour market, as you've talked about many yeah, times. Yeah. If only there was, I don't know, a, a group of, I don't know, about 27 countries that we could tap on. But that's, that's a different <laughs> story. Yeah. Um, and, and so, therefore, yes, the airlines, the airports who have their own play, part to play in this, yeah. um, they've got to make sure they've got the people in place. Uh, they, they will be recruiting, but it's, you can't can't just go from 5% of the operation to 100%. Yeah, security checks, getting yeah. people airside, it's really, really difficult, isn't it? Yeah. Well, Simon, um, I, I'd like to say we look forward to hearing from you in the future. Mm. I don't look forward to it because it's obviously <laughs> going to be very, very difficult, yeah. but it's good to know that you're around to help explain to us what's going on, and indeed, <laughs> Helen Thomas. Now, a spokeswoman for EasyJet told on the money, we are very sorry for the late notice of some of these cancellations and inconvenience caused for customers booked on these flights. However, we believe this is necessary to provide reliable services over this busy period. And a spokesperson from TUI said, we would like to apologise for the inconvenience to customers who've experienced flight delays or a flight cancellation. Delays have been caused due to a combination of factors and we're doing everything we can to keep customers un... Dated. Difficult story. Right, this is On The Money with me, Liam Halligan. Coming up, today's Money Talks interview is with TV star Andrea McLean. She'll be discussing leaving the daytime ITV chat show Loose Women for the world of business, launching her self-help website. This girl is on fire. You don't want to miss that. But first, it's the GB News headlines with Rosie Wright. Good afternoon, it's half past one. I'm Rosie Wright, keeping you up to date today on GB News. The French Interior Minister has blamed massive and industrial-scale ticket fraud for the chaotic scenes at the Champions League final in Paris on Saturday. Violence outside the stadium led to English fans, Liverpool fans, being tear-gassed by French police. Well, French authorities say that out of the 29 people arrested around the stadium, more than half were British citizens. They add more than 100 were arrested in the suburb. Downing Street has refused to deny that a further party took place in number 10 in the flat following Boris Johnson's birthday gathering in the Cabinet Room. A report in the Sunday Times claims details of a second gathering in June 2020 may have been edited out of the Sue Gray report. The Cabinet Office disputes that version of events. Coal-fired power plants, which were due to close later this year, may need to stay open to provide backup electricity this winter. 
A government spokesperson says the decision is due to Moscow's invasion of Ukraine and major disruptions to the flow of Russian gas. The Times newspaper reports as many as six million households could face power cuts if President Putin cuts off more supplies to the EU. Downing Street says it's ready to ditch 350 European Union rules. Number 10 says their new procurement bill will rip up hundreds of complicated and bureaucratic regulations and then replace them with a single framework for securing public sector contracts. The bill's expected to become law next year. A man disguised as an elderly woman in a wheelchair has thrown cake at the portrait of the Mona Lisa. Leonardo da Vinci's painting was unharmed at the Louvre in Paris as the attack left a smear of white cream on its protective glass. The perpetrator, wearing a wig and lipstick, called on people to think of the earth as he was led from the scene. TV online and DAB Plus radio, this is GB News. Direct Bullion sponsors the Finance Report on GB News for gold and silver investment. Here's a quick snapshot of today's markets. The pound is 1.264 to the dollar. The pound is 1.176 to the euro. And the price of gold currently stands at £1,467.45 per ounce. Direct Bullion sponsors the Finance Report on GB News for real-time investment. We are GB News. We're right across this great nation. On TV, on radio, on digital. Absolutely everywhere. We don't talk down to you. We embrace all voices. With honest and civilised conversation. We're not part of the establishment. We're one of you. And we're only getting started. Join us on GB News, the People's Channel. Britain's news channel. Every morning from six o'clock, we'll wake you up with GB News Breakfast with all the stories you didn't know from the night before. So whether it's serious news, entertainment, or your own views from all over our great nation, we're here to kick off your day with a smile. And the national media should be reflecting and reporting what's happening here. You will notice the Northwestern accents. <laughs> whether you're with us on TV, radio, or online, every morning, it's breakfast from 6 a.m. Hope you can join us. Join us for Ministry of Offence, the comedy panel show that's just like the news, in that the left fights the right and it doesn't really seem to matter who wins. We cover the big stories. It was in fact a troop of baboons and not angry vegans. I like that. And the really important stories. Fat naked cow gets stuck in swimming pool. It's a headline in a lot of local newspapers. Yeah. <laughs> We're on the same team, Nick. Yeah, but I'm just helping you. Join us for Ministry of Offence, Saturday nights, 8 o'clock on GB News. I'm Dan Wooten. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV, where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wooten tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. And welcome back. Now, Britain's oldest cinema opened, believe it or not, and I didn't believe this, in 1848 on Regent Street, London. And for well over 100 years, of course, the UK's been at the forefront of what's obviously become a global film and cinema industry. Who needs Hollywood? But when the pandemic hit in March 2020, indoor cinemas were shut for two years with estimated losses of £2.6 billion. But after two summers of streaming from our sofas, the cinema industry has bounced back here in Britain. This January, box offices across the UK and Ireland reported revenues 88% up on the previous year. And now the industry is moving into a new phase. As from today, cinema goers will be able to show a digital ID for proof of age. I'm delighted to welcome Sean Jones, who's Vice President of Operations for the UK and Ireland for Cineworld, and Helen Thomas, CEO of Blonde Money, is still with us here in the studio. Sean, great to have you with us. I love cinema. I'm a huge cinema goer myself. I'm so glad that cinemas are getting back on their feet. Just before we talk about this new digital ID, 
How bad was it? Cineworld's obviously one of our leading cinema providers, but across the piece, did we lose many cinemas in the UK? I, we lost a few independent cinemas, I think, along the way. I mean, it's been hugely challenging for the industry. Um, you know, and we're not out of the woods yet, but, you know, what we're seeing is some really, really strong product coming through, a great slate between now and the end of the year. And, you know, we're just very excited to, to welcome customers back to our cinemas. I was saying earlier in the show, Sean, I'm old enough to remember power cuts in the 70s. I'm also old enough to remember you know, the introduction of VHS and Betamax in the early 1980s, bunking off school to watch The Evil Dead and The Warriors and all the rest of it, The Wanderers. God, I remember those days. But we all said at the time, this must be the death of cinema because we're all going to stay home and watch these VHS Betamax films. It hasn't happened. People still love going to the cinema. What is it? Is, the, is it the big seats? Is it the bucket of popcorn? Is it getting out of the house? Or is it just watching a film knowing that there are others around you? What is the magic of cinema? Do you know what, Liam? You're absolutely right. I mean, I've been in cinema since 1984 uh, when I started working in a cinema back in Rill in North Wales. Uh, and I've been in cinema ever since. And you're absolutely right. Every sort of obstacle, um, you know, people say this will be the end of the cinema as soon as this new piece of technology arrives. And it's just not the case. You know, people still want the escapism. They still want good value from a visit to the cinema with their family. I mean, at City World, we've been investing in 4DX and ScreenX and IMAX and all those other offers just to make the experience, um, you know, just let people watch the films the way they want to watch them. You know, and we're so pleased that the customers are coming back and they are coming back. Well, I mean, this weekend alone, you know, the Top Gun film has broken all records. It's the second biggest opening film this week, it's done, uh, sorry, this year, it's done 15.9 million over the opening um, uh, few days. It's definitely Tom Cruise's um, biggest release. Wow. Um, so it really shows there's an appetite for people to come back to the cinema, but they want a good experience. You know, the key thing is the experience. It's not just about watching the film, it's everything. It's the whole journey. You're a big cinema fan? Do you like going there with your... Do you, are, you, are you a salted or sweet popcorn person? That's the main I thing. I don't even like popcorn. <laughs> Isn't that awful? I don't like popcorn. I love chocolate, though. I love the ice cream. Oh, that's a nightmare. But why do we keep going back? I, do you know, I, I, I've had a, a, a sort of love-hate relationship with cinema, actually. Um, loved it, loved it in my sort of teens and 20s. Absolutely hated it after that. I'm kind of tentative now, and I have to say, the Top Gun film <laughs> is tempting me back <laughs> for the first time in years. Um, I will be... Uh, I think what we're finding now with, you know, entertainment is there's just a lot of other ways, you know, there's the streaming at home, yeah. but there is also something about that communal live experience. Um, you turn your phone off, no-one yes. can bother you, it's, it's a proper... Sean just used the word escapism. Yes. It's escapism, think... and a lot of us feel we need some escapism at the moment. Yeah, absolutely, and I think, you know, it certainly Top Gun seems to promise that, doesn't it? But, I mean, I think <laughs> it, it, Hollywood has to rise up to the challenge, not just Hollywood you're talking about here as well. You know, we have to we have to create things, new, fresh ideas people want to watch. Oh, we had a lot of rehashes. I mean, I am yeah. keen to see Top Gun, but goodness me, I mean, you know, what's that? We're living back in the 1980s. We've talked indeed, a lot in this indeed, show about indeed. the 70s and the 80s. So I'd like to see some new... New ideas, which I'm sure will be there, but um, but you know, let, you know, let's embrace it all. Let's embrace it all. I, I love the idea that the theatre is now beamed into cinemas, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah. So absolutely. you know, let's mix it all up. Sean, so when I were a lad, films were you, if anyone could watch them, and then A, and then double A. You had to be 14. I used to get him when I was yeah. about 11. A bit, a bit of dirt on the top lip to make it look as if I had a moustache coming. And then X. I remember I couldn't see Saturday Night Fever because it was an X. And I wanted to see Saturday Night Fever. Right. Of, of course, they're, they're much simpler now, 12 and, and 18. Tell us about this new digital ID. What's the difference with now for kids who want to get into the cinema, making sure that they only see appropriate things? Yeah, well, you know, for us, like I said about the, the, you know, the journey into the cinema, we want to make it as easy as possible and as pain-free, and you know, not just for children, but for adults as well. And it's very frustrating, I think, for parents when they have to give their children a passport or um, some other form of ID to come into the cinema. This does away with all of this. Um, so once signed up, you know, you, you present, you basically present your oh. app like this. 
at the cinema. And if you can just see in the corner here, when the phone's then tilted, it's got a hologram within the app. So it's very, it's, it's very, very straightforward. It doesn't give too much personal detail out. It just says whether they're over 15, whether they're over 18. Um, it's a, a fantastic, um, uh, you know, new piece of technology. And of course, everybody comes to the cinema with smartphones now. So it just makes it easier for everybody all round. That's fascinating. I've never heard of a hologram on a phone. Otherwise, you could just I screenshot know. it, right? And you could superimpose your own face That's over it. your elder brother's <laughs> over 18 thing. So yeah. there's an actual hologram on, on the phone, like there's yeah. a hologram often on banknotes to make sure that they're not frauds. That's right. And if you tilt the phone, the hologram moves with the phone. Um, and it's a very, very simple process to set it up. You can, you can use the Yoti app or the Partners Post Office uh, ID app. It's already had 11 million downloads already. Um, you know, we are quite excited to see this uh, through. We're having all the staff trained uh, now so they know what to check for. It's very important for us that, you know, people go into the cinema and they are of the correct age. It's not just about the film, though, is it, Helen? A cinema is often, you know, the centre of, of an out-of-town shopping centre. It's the centre of a community. It's fabulous if we can keep these cinemas going. And indeed, some of those independent cin cinemas that did lose out, as Sean said, during the pandemic, can get back up on their feet. Yeah, I, that was, uh, you know, a shame to hear about that because I think a lot of those independent cinemas are kind of uh, curated by just lovers of film. That's right. They also all are about the experience. Some of them have, you know, those lovely big sofas and chairs and they do food and, you know, drinks at your seat and all that sort of thing. But, yeah, I mean, that, that's the thing, isn't it? Is, is, it's often the cinema is alongside the bowling alley right. and the, um, you know, little a few restaurants and all that, you know. It, Place you where want, youngsters I, hang out. It can be the centre of a community it can be and and I, yes the idea of you know that the film is just part of it it's the going out and doing things and, for, and you know for many kids it's getting out of the house and doing your own thing isn't it <laughs> by the way i like this id thing they're going to use that in pubs that's really think. interesting isn't it i've I, not heard of that I, a hologram I, on a phone i tell you this on my 40th birthday i went to sainsbury's to get some gin and i got id'd <laughs> i was quite i was very proud of that liam very proud Helen Thomas there on that bombshell, <laughs> CEO of Blonde Money. And indeed, Sean Jones, Vice President of Operations for UK and Ireland for Cineworld. Much enjoy the conversation, Sean, and I love the James Bond mm. backdrop. I'll be getting myself one of those on the money. Now it's time for my daily interview series, Money Talks. And my guest today is none other than Andrea McLean. She's formerly a presenter, of course, on the hit ITV daytime television chat show, Loose Women. Born in Glasgow, McLean trained as a journalist and then became a presenter on the Weather Channel before moving to GMTV. She went on to co-present Loose Women famously from 2007 to 2020. In June 2018, though, McLean launched her own company, This Girl Is On Fire, with her husband, Nick Feeney. She decided to go into business and work for herself, given the huge response to her best-selling book, Confessions of a Menopausal Woman. And in 2021, McLean and Feeney became certified life coaches, developing their This Girl Is On Fire website and app to create an online community featuring interviews and advice for women wanting to relight their fire, in her words. And so here they are. Andrea McLean and husband Nick Feeney, my latest guests on Money Talks. <laughs> Andrea, you were a very successful presenter on Loose Women for many years, and now you've gone into business. How did that happen? <laughs> Do you know, I just woke up one day and thought, oh, I fancy doing something different. Um, I'd been working on This Girl Is On Fire quietly on the side for quite a few years before I decided to make the leap and, and do it full time. And why did I decide to make the leap? Because... I realized it wasn't something that I could continue doing as a bit part thing. Um, Nick had already given up his job to, to work full time on it. I was trying to oversee it and, and work together with him, but still splitting myself into a thousand pieces doing presenting work. And it just made sense that I needed to actually commit. So the, the, the biggest obstacle really was overcoming the fear of making that jump in the first place. Loose Women is a tremendously successful television brand. It's an institution. You were part of that institution. 
What made you feel you needed to write books on the side? Why wasn't TV enough? Of course, your first book was Confessions of a Menopausal Woman at a time when talking about the menopause publicly was, there was less of it about than there is now, may I put it mm. like that. What made you feel you needed to do more to assert yourself on the page as well as being on camera so regularly? Because telly wasn't where I was meant to be. Uh, it was where I found myself. So you I made a pretty good impression I, I of somebody right. who's meant to be on telly, if I may say yeah, so. Yeah, yeah, I did all right. I, I actually, um, I moved to London when I was 24, literally with no contacts and everything owned in the back seat of my car to be a writer. And through misreading that. a job advert, ended up accidentally auditioning to be a weather presenter, which I thought was really funny. And I thought I can write a piece about what's it like to audition to be a weather presenter, but I ended up getting the job. And I ended up quitting what was a, a staff position as a writer and production editor to go into TV for what I thought would be a short period of time. And because I ended up working on breakfast telly, I was able to do reporting as well. So I was kind of feeding the two beasts, if you like. So I was nurturing my, my interviewing skills, but I was just doing it in a different way. But writing has always been my first love. And it's funny, um, Confessions of a Menopausal Woman was actually my second book. Oh. I've actually written four. People forget about my first one, which was an autobiographical book about growing up in the Caribbean, living around the world when I was uh, younger, before my telly life. I feel like I've had about 10 lives. People Where did you grow up? I actually grew up in Trinidad. Wow. In the, good in carnival, Caribbean. Trinidad. Very good carnival. Yeah, good carnival. And I make a very good rum punch. <laughs> and where did you meet um, Andrea and Nick? And do you see her as a television person first? or as a writer first? Uh, well, we met on a blind date that was uh, set up by a makeup artist uh, from, from ITV. Mm. And uh, I mean, that was eight and a half years ago now. But where I see her, do, do you know what's been amazing? I, I think obviously for the first period of our relationship was very much, it, it was Andrea as I knew her, but mm. she was definitely the lady off the telly. Mm. You know, you can't help that when you walk around and, and you get people shouting her name and all sorts of bits. And um, but the most fascinating time is spending the last year and a half with her where she's really committed to what she wants to deliver from This Girl Is On Fire. And the change in her as an individual, the growth that she's had, I just see her now as this not a CEO, but a CVO, a chief visionary officer. And she is bringing some great things to the table for our business and, and for the community that we serve. So, yeah. So This Girl Is On Fire, your third book, my mistake, um, given that you did the first autobiographical one, then you did Confessions of a Menopausal Woman. You, you're, you left Loose Women in, I think, 2020. You want to make it into... A, a, a brand, a sort of, you're becoming a lifestyle coach, you've set up this business between you. What's the vision here, Andrew McLean? How big can this be? Oh, absolutely global. And my, my, my global vision for This Girl Is On Fire is we, we, we wrote it out, didn't we, on our whiteboard in, in our office a, a few years ago, and it felt really bold, but now it actually feels achievable, is I want to empower 100 million women around the world to live a life they love. And what I mean by that is to have economic freedom and to have emotional freedom. And we do it by making them feel confident. We give them the, the life skills that they need that they can either do better at work, feel better at home. So for me, it's a, it's a, global, it's a global ambition. It's a, it's a strange one to, you know, to hear you saying uh, as, as well how much I've grown in the, in the past year and a half. It's been so incremental that I haven't noticed it. It's just become, this is who I am now. Because for so many years, my identity, like you said, absolutely was wrapped up in, I'm that lady off the telly who did that thing. Whereas now I'm the lady off this Girls on Fire who does this thing. But actually, they're like a mixture of the two me's. Nick, you obviously possess between you a lot of media savvy, a lot of contacts, and a lot, of, a lot of brand, both Andrea's brand, your collective brand. Uh, you're starting a business with the name of a book that's already well-established by a very well-known person, if I may say so. How are you monetizing this? What's the offer to consumers? Why should I invest? Um, well, so we've spent the last sort of 
16 months, understanding, we, we, we created a small community to come in to our membership for a, a token fee, knowing that they were going to help us create a platform that would serve women and help them find the mindset that they need to deal with what issues that they were going through in their life at that moment. So with the last 16 months, we've been going, okay, does this work for you? Does this work for you? And we've honed this membership. And we've Tell me about this membership. What's the age range? What's the demography? Well, and is it exclusively women? Okay, so definitely exclusively women yeah. at the moment, but yeah. this guy is on fire is going to be um, launched in uh, the third quarter of this year. Okay. And the reason it's exclusively for women is because ultimately it was because of what Andrea had gone through in her personal life that we started putting... You know, so you asked about the confessions of a menopausal woman. Mm, mm. That was written because over 10,000 women got in touch mm. privately with Andrea in 24 hours. Mm. And it was like, we couldn't believe there After was... she a... started talking about yeah. how she was feeling. Mm, mm. We couldn't believe there was... And you were one was... of the early ones, really. I, oh, yeah. I, I Something really big has happened in the last sort yeah. of five, ten years. On the... And even in the last two or three years. Definitely. And, and what people don't realise is is I got a lot of stick for it. People might think, oh, you're that menopause woman and, and you, you sort of charge the... You're at the forefront of it. Yes, and I got slapped in the face, metaphorically. Um, because newspapers didn't like it, the press didn't like it, uh, some women didn't like it, a lot of men didn't like it. Um, but all I saw it was, this is an experience that I've had. I have uh, the, the, the skill set to interview a doctor and get the medical information that you'll need. Let me put it all together for mm. you in a really mm. nice way, mm. and, he, and here you go. And for me, it was, it started this process of, Actually, I really enjoy helping people by getting experts involved and passing on that information. So I broadened it right out. So and letting women know that they're normal to feel that the way they feel. That's really yeah. what you did, isn't it? Yeah. You are, with all respect, forgive me, the beautiful, glamorous woman off the television with the dream life. Mm. And yet you are feeling this way mm. and you're talking about that. So everyone should feel fine if they feel that way. Yeah. They're not abnormal. Yeah, and whether it's about the menopause, whether it is about people talking about their mental health, which people are much more open about talk, discussing now, um, whether it is a crisis of confidence, whether it's a crisis of faith, whether it's a crisis of identity, we are all simply human beings doing different jobs on the, on the planet. And how I see it is that the, the more you open yourself up and talk about your experiences, you normalize it for everybody. And that was Andrew McLean and her husband, Nick Feeney. And you can listen to the full 25-minute version of that interview now on my Money Talks podcast. You can watch the full 25-minute version on the GB News YouTube channel or via the GB News app. You'll find there many, many Money Talks interviews from previous months. Now, let's bring in some of your views on today's topic. Do we face 1970s-style power cuts? Robert says... Can National Grid ensure power cuts only happen in areas where fracking was opposed? <laughs> I see what you did there. Gareth says thousands of homes with open fires should fit log burners with immediate effect. And John says we should be fracking for gas, drilling for oil and gas, nuclear energy and removing the green levy. I love your show and your forthright way of speaking. Thank you, John. That's very kind of you. TV is a team effort. It's not just me. Keep your emails coming and tell me what you want to be discussed on this show because that's all we've got time for today here on The Money. But you can join me tomorrow at 1pm where we'll be continuing to focus on the cost of living crisis, helping you to beat the squeeze. But for today, this is GB News. I'm Liam Halligan and that was On The Money. Hello, Alex Deacon here with your latest weather update. Plenty of showers across the country today. Some sunny spells around as well, but it's not particularly warm for the end of May. Low pressure is in control of our weather. It's a fairly slow moving area of low pressure. Not a lot of isobars on the chart, which means the winds are light, which means the showers are slow moving. So you can get stuck under the showers for quite a while through the afternoon.